The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Are you making the most of your KiwiSaver investment? Generate is an award-winning KiwiSaver provider with a track record of strong long-term performance. Making a smart decision now could add tens of thousands of dollars by the time you reach retirement. Book a no-obligation chat with a Generate KiwiSaver advisor today at generatekiwisaver.co.nz slash advice. A copy of the product disclosure statement is available at generatekiwisaver.co.nz. The issuer of the scheme is Generate Investment Management Limited and, of course, past performance does not guarantee future returns. I'm Toby Manhire and this is Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. A podcast in six parts. Doesn't give my opponents much time to run up to an election, does it? This nation is at risk. What do you think you're up to now, you perverted little liar? I can smell the uranium on it as you lean towards it. <laughs> There's a radical overhaul in the history of New Zealand's administration. Juggernaut, the story of the fourth Labour government. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Listen now on the spin-off or wherever you get your podcasts. Annabelle Lee Mesa. What's up, my arrogant bastards? <laughs> oh, not with arrogant pricks. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> it's just like, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going now. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Welcome to Gone by Lunchtime, the very last podcast, this award-winning podcast of 2022. Ben Thomas, you're excited to win that award, the New Zealand Podcast Awards Best Current Affairs Podcast. Uh, I'm nothing if not consistent in my beliefs, so I refuse to acknowledge its jurisdiction. Annabelle Mather, how are you? Oh, you know, just radiating in the glory of being the number one Current Affairs podcast yeah. and you, the most informed, the most informative Current Affairs yeah. podcast yeah. in New Zealand. You win a lot of awards, though, it's fair to say. Um, well, I wasn't going to say anything, <laughs> but you know, I mean, being incredibly way. humble and stuff, I wasn't no, it's cool. no, it back, back to the, 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 there's yeah, be, There's going to be two, there's going to be an opinion writer and column writer Award oh. at the Voyages next year. Yeah, right. What does that so, mean? So, well, it just means that we have a we have a, we have a, we have a chance of getting sort of an Annabelle size hall of awards. Now that there are two, two separate awards That's for so people weird, who the write they, they stuff in magazines and newspapers. That will have happened because the newspaper editors will have got cross. Yeah, that will have been like we don't get enough awards. People who write, you know. Proper columns, which is proper ones that come out every Saturday morning. Yeah, or every, every, or every second lovely, Thursday in the Dominion well, Post. So you've got to prove a regularity about yeah. it. Okay, and 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 I think you know, good good old fashioned argument making. Not all this yeah. weepy impressionistic stuff in about how you column, might have had In this column, I will explore <laughs> issues, issues around culture. reducing the voting age to sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> In conclusion, <laughs> love it. Um, Samuel, thanks for looking after us again today. Sure, everybody. Happy New Year to you. We, I, we, I don't think we're going to do awards and bests and you know, no. winners and losers. I, I mean, feel like we've already won the awards, that, and I feel there? like for us to to like give awards to others would be to diminish. The oh, manner of our awards. So I feel like we should only acknowledge. Oblige. Yeah, yeah. I think we just we don't do that. That's all over. Yeah, we That's just hold obvious. the manner of the award winning. There's definitely been. I I don't. Is it me or has there been even more winners and losers in 2022 politics? The end of this year, I feel as though there has been quite a lot of inflation. Yeah, um, well, like Adrian Orr needs to say, cool your jets on the winners and losers of politics in 2020. Anyway, we're not going to do them. In, in an election year, it's really easy because you just go, oh, the winner is the person who won the election, <laughs> the loser is the person who lost the election. And then. See, that's where I've been doing it wrong all these years. And, and yeah, and as we get further out, then, then you get into this sort of, you know, it's, it's like waves in the ocean and mm. there's sort of reactions and counter reactions and the dialectic happens. And eventually, you know, people have to come up with these sort of counterintuitive ideas. The same reason that I nominated Nanaya Mahuda as, you know, my winner of the year for the spinoff.co.nz, mm. a popular alternative website that looks at politics and current affairs. Interesting. Um, do, do I think that's because she achieved the most in New Zealand politics this year? Well, maybe, because of Three Waters. But, you know, under a normal metric, you probably wouldn't put her first. But because that ranking came out quite late... 
I have to be sort of contrarian to all the people who yes. said, oh, it's Christopher Luxon for bringing the Nats into contention. Mm. It's Nicola Willis for doing mm. a great job in yeah. finance and yeah. mopping up after Lux- Luxon's mess. It's um, Jacinda Ardern, if you're a former Jacinda Ardern staffer, they've all been out writing their columns. That one, one woman has really bestrode the political yeah, <laughs> landscape like a So you did it in order to stand out amongst the crowd, didn't you, Ben? Really? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and you've always been a bit old fashioned like that. And, the, like, and the later, no, but this is, this is a perennial, and this is how you always end up with. You always find these people who have gone on to have strange, querulous political careers, or at least slightly idiosyncratic ones, like Jim Anderton, you know, the former um, leader of the Alliance Party, got up to deputy prime minister. But when he was a young man, he he was on he was selected by Time Magazine as a future leader, a future world leader. And that's for the reason that, you know, unless you have a standout like Ardern or something, you've got to, you know, you have to choose something that's a bit sort of ultra or a bit off off kilter to prove that you have special insight that other people mm. don't. And that's why, you know, the, the longer you leave your your sort of winners and awards and stuff to the end of the year, like the dumber and weirder and less convincing your choices yeah. will sound. What do you make of that thesis, Annabelle? Is that the way you approach the winners and losers lists of the year, or do you simply write down the people you think are the winners and losers? No, that, yeah, that's what I've done in the past, but from now on I'm going to be following Ben's advice. I think he's bang on the money. And, and with that in mind, my winner for this year is the um, the former MP for Hamilton West. <laughs> <laughs> um I can't even remember his name. I mean, that's so tragic. Go to Sharma. I can't remember his name. I, was just I, I only remember the Momentum Party. But you know, well, the, they'll be back. The, I mean, the, the man, the man burned up and shriveled away long ago, but the movement remains. And <laughs> the Momentum like is a, unstoppable, like, like rolling a, into twenty twenty three. Like a rata that started growing in the branches of a Cody and then mm. tracked down. You know, go to Sharma and Hamilton West is no more. But the Momentum Party just. Keeps going. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll touch on that on our ride through. What we're going to do instead is look at each of the political parties, see where the conversation leads us, and cast forward a bit towards 2023. Does that sound acceptable? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start, with, <laughs> let's start with the party which has a majority of seats in the House of Representatives, the Labour Party. Um, and about the end of year interview round that Jacinda Ardern did included a few interesting talking points. One that she put out there, it became clear, was a line that they had quite deliberately designed for sharing was that they would be pairing back the work programme what what's behind that message? Do you think it's trying to send a signal? I guess that they accept there's too much on. I mean, I wondered also whether that was kind of partly sending a message to her own party that she was quite serious about it, rather than just saying they need to cut back. Now it's sort of out there in public. There's gonna there's gonna be some slashing of the work program. Mm. I don't think it's so much that they've got too much on. I think it's that they recognise that some of their policies are incredibly unpalatable to a number of voters and they want to be seen to be responsive and not having to try and sell them throughout the election period. So I think it's you know just mm. recognition that... Um, that if they want to get re-elected next year, they're going to have to let a couple of things go. So they're, they're trying to nail down their narrative, right, which is that, you know, having fallen far from Bill English and John Key's National Party um, under the opposition of T- Todd Muller and Judith Collins, we are now, we've gone from the cusp of something special to the precipice of something awful, Mm. Uh, facing global headwinds. Headwinds the is tension. the word word of the year. A lot of headwinds. So many headwinds. Headwinds. It's 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 Armageddon imagery, just like the climate change movie where the guy is literally outrunning the blizzard that is freezing the whole world, and then he gets into a room where there's a heater at mm. the end of the movie. That's what the Labour government's promising. A, a sanctuary. I do have Safety. a certain amount of like sympathy for them because I feel like. You know, the, there's for a long time 
you know, the government's been criticised for not being ambitious enough, yeah. then it feels like we've got to the end of six years and they're like, ta-da, here's a whole lot of stuff. But, um, but, but because we've been through COVID, there's just, you know, people have become accustomed to things like homelessness and child poverty now. Nobody's that bothered by those things. But post-COVID, people seem to be very bothered by things like co-governance because co-governance represents having to share power. And I feel like over the last three years, people have felt incredibly disempowered by all sorts of things like COVID and vaccine mandates and all of that. Mm. And so... And so, you know, some of it is actually not incredibly extreme stuff, but but the national mood has shifted. Yeah, I think co-governance is a particularly interesting one because, as I've long maintained, the government doesn't know what it's talking about when it talks about co-governance. Mm. They don't have a picture in their head of what they actually want to implement, which is why it's so easy to sort of discard, I think. <laughs> you know, they intend to one day have a response to this Hepua Pua report, mm. um, which itself was very vague, very broad strokes, didn't actually have, you know, any particular kind of policy prescriptions. Um at the same time, because probably because of that uncertainty, if and because of you know ambient low level racism in the electorate, there it stokes a lot of fear about what it could mean, um, especially because the terms aren't defined well. And so this is a very easy one for them to kind of you know shove away. But I think you're right; it, it, it's people right now are looking at things much more as a sort of zero-sum game. Mm. You know, I remember back in 2020 and the beginning of 2021, the economy seemed to have rebounded really strongly um, from COVID because everyone had kept their jobs, so we didn't have anything like this 10% unemployment that had been predicted at the beginning of the pandemic. And we trusted the government, they'd steered us through it well, everyone was feeling richer, by and large, unless, you know, you hadn't even been sacked for not getting a vaccine, you know, that was still nine months off if you're in that sort of camp um there was a lot of pent-up demand you know things like um you know guy i knew who ran a, a, a recreational store they ran out of you know fishing boats and stuff you know that's because that's what people were spending their money on yeah so that was a perfect time and the, the government took advantage of it and raised benefits Um, because normally, you know, ordinarily the stereotype of the electorate is people think beneficiaries are bludgers, but, oh, well, my tax is going towards them. And the secret is when people are feeling good about themselves and their prospects, then you can raise benefits as much as you like because Mm. people don't feel like they have to jealously guard their share of things. Mm. When you get into a situation, (laughs) we've still got economic growth here, but people are more worried about the future and more worried about the cost of living, Mm. then they start to freak out about, you know, they start thinking that anything that... um, you know, quote unquote, minority gets whether it's poor people, Maori, whatever. They think it's coming out of their grocery bills, <laughs> and, they, and they start to get more sort of uppity about it. It's the same posture that informs some of the fear around law and order as well, isn't it? It's generally a kind of feeling of insecurity, which is one of the reasons that you hear Grant Robinson now pushing the word security. Max Rashbrook made a made that point in a piece he wrote for us recently. You hear the word that Grant Robinson is also deploying balance. You know, it's all this stuff, mm. and it's sort of leaning into crisis mode and going, we accept this is happening, headwinds, storm clouds, yep. all of that. Um, we just got, need to... We need to shelter. It's not the sun shining, fix the roof that you talked about. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the Prime Minister is shone during crises, right? That's, you know, an, an, an arguable feature of her first two terms. Um, her high points have been dealing with big crises, you mm-hmm. know, and sort of at the, at the podium, which we... <laughs> even 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 her Deputy Prime Minister popped up this week, say, calling the podium of truth... <laughs> In jest or in seriousness? Uh, no, well, as, as you know, as, as a sort of sneering way of saying, you know, these people who thought they knew better than us with their lockdowns. It's like Winston, Winston Peters is engaged in like a sort of oh, so Winston. Sorry, yeah, Winston, I, thought, I thought you were talking about Grant Robinson. No, 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 Win, no yeah. Win, Winston's, oh, Winston's back and, and he's, in, tear, and he's yeah. engaged in he's engaged in a painstaking investigation to try and discover who who was deputy prime minister <laughs> and propping up the Labour government between <laughs> between the years of twenty seventeen and twenty. 20. <laughs> and once he finds out, <laughs> it's going to be hell to pay, Sonny. <laughs> so the pairing back, I mean, it looks like, we could speculate endlessly on, on this, but it looks like the merger might 
might be up against the wall. If, if you wanted to be cynical, you'd say the pairing back is going to be stuff that they don't know how to do anyway. Well, I mean, but that's that's <laughs> part of it, and that part of it is also, I think, a little. I think part of it is a bit of humility. It's discipline. It's humility. It's balanced security. But it's also there's been some stubbornness. Like you think about the nurses thing, which they've known for a while they're oh, going to yeah. have to turn yeah. around on, and just the sort of obstinacy that 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 this at least says. We've seen it with three waters as well. You know, like the the lack of concessions that came out of the select committee when there was general kind of upset around the country. But, but, but this is, 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 is saying, OK, we're going to make some... We're going to, we're going to chuck some stuff off the side. Right? But, but here you're pointing to the, the invidious position that they've found themselves in. And, you know, we talk about, you know, thing narrative and optics and stuff. But the, the reality is there is a mood around a government, you know, however sort of inchoate, however um, porous the borders are. And this government is in that sort of position where it's hard for them to do anything, right? So, you know, you compare and contrast. Three waters, then back down, they pushed it through. Something had to be done about water infrastructure and funding, had to be removed from councils. That was the most important thing, had to be removed from direct council control in order to correct the perverse incentives about investing. They they saw it through at great political cost. You know who who knows what the internal drivers were or the internal politics. At great cost, they eventually forced it through, and they will be hoping that they can have it sort of implemented and embedded enough that by the time you know if the government does change, um, you know it's it's too far gone to reverse. Compare and contrast with um, nurses, where they've finally you know backed down. Um, and people say, well, you flip-flopped. What took you so long? So you're either obstinate or you're indecisive. And at this point, in, and at this point, you know, it's hard for them to find any kind of path that doesn't lead to one of those conclusions. I think the problem that the government's created for itself is that it's not just about one merger. They've created a whole lot of different mergers. So you've got Te Pukenga, you've got the health authority, you've got mm. the water assets, you've got the RMA. So, I mean, it's hard to do one merger, let alone a whole lot, and some of it's just unnecessary. Like, in my view, the polytechs didn't need to be merged. They just needed someone to go in and sack the boards and the CEOs of the of the institutions that weren't performing and create a new plan where they're more responsive to the needs of the students in their community. But instead, we've got this huge blob of... Centralisation. Centralisation. Nobody really knows what's going on. So, But th- they've created that across the board. The momentum, unlike um, good half, is like not there. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and so now you've got a whole lot of these sort of unfinished, you know, pieces of work. The and implementation now, and, unit, though. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and now they're saying they're going to pair it back. The problem is, is that if they pair too much back, then they just look completely ineffectual and they've spent a whole lot of their political capital mm. on, on, on pieces of work that they couldn't actually deliver on. So I think they'll need to be really mind, uh, careful about how much they do actually pair back because then it, they, it, it, I think it'll have an even more detrimental effect it's on It's like them. when you're, you know, when you're cutting your hair and you go just a bit more there or a hedge, a bit more there and just a bit more and then before you know it, it's just an absolute, un- it's just a mess. It's just mm. a stalk. That was a wonderful metaphor. That's a metaphor for the. That's a metaphor for pairing back the TVNZ and RNZ merger until all you're left with is a a simulcast breakfast show by Simon Bridges <laughs> across both organisations. Also, there's also income insurance, which it seems like. I mean, I think Grant Robinson is quite attached to it, but I wouldn't surprise me if that one just got kicked forward. I, I think it would be hard to 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 kick the merger down the road because it would just still be there hanging over you. I think that one might just get a line through it, whereas income insurance, unemployment insurance might just be that's a third term thing, much yep. as the much as the co governance program has been moved yep. to let's address in third term. The other I mean the other We sort should of, reiterate the co governance program that doesn't exist. 
the thing about well, I mean, this, this is this is part a, of why I don't understand why they let themselves get into so much grief for this. Mm. Is that they don't actually have a program for implementing anything they would call co-governance. There isn't a plan, and, and I, I, I mean, there could be, but I would be incredibly surprised if somewhere sitting in the bowels of TPK, yeah. there is a cabinet paper in draft form that's one day going to go up to the minister that says we're going to reorganise every government department, so half of it's Māori, half of it's the mm. crown mm. Um, and half of half of the parliament is going to be Maori seats and a half of the fire service is go, chief executive office has to be Maori mm. you know I, I don't think that exists I don't think anything even similar to it exists I think there's probably somewhere a tentative timetable for more consultation mm. <laughs> at most the like, thing that bemuses me about the whole co-governance um, discussion is hearing people say, look, we need to have a debate. We need to have a discussion as a society about what this means. It's like, actually, these conversations have mm. been going on for decades and decades and actually over a cent- century, literally since the treaty was signed. Go to any marae, go to any court in the country, you know, go to any council and listen to, like, submissions on whatever's happening. These discussions are already happening. Um, So really it's up to individuals to educate themselves, particularly political leaders. But I think the problem, you know, as Ben says, is that the government has not defined what it is that they mean. Because in the mind of ordinary voters, it's become this big, scary tanifa hiding around every corner that's going to, like, you know, take all their resource or assets and power away from them. And it's actually not that. And honestly, when I hear people talking about co-governance as a form of apartheid, it literally blows my mind. Like, on what universe is sharing power with the people that you share your country with? a form of apartheid. It's actually the the opposite. Anyway. We'll come to Winston Peters later. <laughs> the, very briefly on the... I mean, the for, 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 for Labour in New Zealand, the summer holiday break falls at the same time as the end of the parliamentary year break, and that signal of pairing back, and then there'll be a reshuffle early, in the early part of next year in January, and it's that old challenge, and we saw it, We've seen it in every government that goes on to its fifth, sixth year. It's about the whole how can they renew, revive, rejuvenate, yada, yada. Right? Mm. How are they going to do that, Ben? Well, what politicians always go to is this reshuffle, right? And I, th- I think that um, people in Wellington sometimes think that a reshuffle is a bigger event for the outside world than it perhaps is, uh, because it is such a momentous event in Wellington itself. You know, well, just stop, just stop. For, like, of course, there isn't the same attention on it and the examination of all the criminology and blah, blah, blah. But that uh, famous minor reshuffle mm-hmm. that took place in whenever, when, when was it? August, maybe? Yeah. Um, when, you know, you had a change in the police portfolio, for yeah. example, it may not be that everyone was paying attention, but it was an important moment and it was contained within it, the departure of Farfoy, the mover of Kitty Allen, to justice and so yep. on and so on. Um, important in terms of sending signals that then ripple further out. Yeah, and let Kerry Allen take over those, um, yeah, those, those difficult <laughs> issues from uh, Pearl Farfoy. Um, yeah, and, th- and that was a pretty deft one. Um, I think sometimes what you, sometimes you see in election year, you know, in the past, um, we've seen there'll be these sort of minor shuffles sort of around the top of cabinet with these kind of minor portfolios that don't really bring your so-called new talent sort of into the public mix that much. I mean, if you're looking at sort of who's going to get promoted, the obvious um, options are Barbara Edmonds, um, who's currently the chair of the Finance and Expenditure Committee. Um, she's one of their smartest MPs, certainly one of their most uh, financially and economically literate. Um, she's very articulate um, in terms of the support base. You know, Quite she, funny. She, she's, she, she's actually got a very good social media sensibility. Um, yeah, she and she was very she was very funny uh, when interviewed by Mad Chapman about the infamous uh, Stuart Nash. Very funny. Stuart Nash topless fax photo. Um, I felt a lot for her there because she, she was a former staffer in his office, and you could tell by the way that she was describing 
Nash, you know, trying to peel his shirt over the guns unsuccessfully because of an injury that he was carrying from the gym. <laughs> and, you know, just, just as he was instructing her how to take a photo and stuff, you know, I was, I was like, yeah, that's right. When he wants a stuffer, always a stuffer, as far as uh, politicians are concerned. Um, but yeah, no, you, you would probably be looking at her to pick up um, commerce, might be one that they would look at for her because that that would that would solve a bunch of problems. David Clark is retiring, RIP, uh, spend more time at the beach on his mountain bike. He, um, the, the, yeah. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> yeah. um, and, but there is still a bit of work in that portfolio. Mm-hmm. You know, they might, they might want to talk about a, a market study on some contentious industry because of um, the cost of living. They got quite a lot of mileage out of that supermarket one. Got quite a lot of mileage out of the, um, the petroleum one, uh, you know, uh, some time ago. So that, that 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 might be something where a new minister, you know, an impressive minister, can be in the public eye and be contributing to you know towards the government's re-election chances. Rachel Brooking is somebody that they rate really highly. Will you know quite likely, I'd say, to take over uh, Clark's seat down in Dunedin. Mm-hmm. Bagari Maynard. Yeah, and that that's why I think that they might actually want to keep her in the select committee um, as the deputy chair in order to see that legislation through safely. Um, so I, there, there could be, you know, she might actually sort of miss out because she's needed on the back benches. Because I think if David, it was probably crucial for Parker to get that legislation through. Yep. Um, you know, Parker is one of the policy brains of Labour, <clears throat> extremely smart guy, extremely dedicated politician, very good person. And if he doesn't get the Natural and Built Environments Act through before this election and they lose, he will finish a long and storied political career having achieved basically nothing. And they can't really afford that. Hello for lover. I'm Madeline Chapman, editor at The Spinner. If you have the means, consider supporting our high-quality journalism by becoming a Spinoff member. Sign up now at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. Are you curious about how business can be better? I'm Simon Pound, and I host Business is Boring, a podcast where I caught it all with some of the most interesting people in entrepreneurship, commerce, and making things happen. Tune in to Business is Boring every Tuesday, brought to you by the Spinoff Podcast Network in partnership with Spark Business Lab. Do you find it hard staying optimistic with all the financial news in the media? I'm Bernard Hickey, and on my podcast, When the Facts Change, I'm here to help you navigate the ever-changing landscape of economics in Aotearoa. So join the conversation every Friday on When the Facts Change, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in partnership with KiwiBee. Let's move on, pair back this podcast, which is already running over length, <laughs> to, to National, um, who are now, I think, unambiguously in the pole position or favourites going into election year. The polling is pretty clear on that. And about the distance that they've been travelled, that they've travelled across the course of 2022 can be measured in a bunch of ways. Christopher Luxon you know, sometimes struggling his way through but making it through alive in a way that previous leaders haven't. Nicola Willis coming in to fill the role of um, New Zealand leading podcaster Simon Bridges and providing a real ballast for Luxon. But also those two by-elections, if we think about the two by-elections, astonishingly the Tauranga one was in June, which seems impossible to Mm. me, but it was. And what happened with Sam, not just Sam Uffendale and what we learned afterwards, but also just that lineup that we've talked about before of the shortlist for national candidates. And then if we fast forward to Hamilton West, where on December the 10th, was it, low turnout? We haven't talked about that much, but a very clear win for national. T- to no great surprise, but a very, you know, it sort of mm-hmm. reinforced, confirmed a, a trajectory. But not just that, but for national, you had. Tama Potaka, who you know a bit from back in the day, um, who immediately looks like someone you would want to be promoting in National's own reshuffle in January as a sort of fresh energy. Does that sort of define the good part of the year for National to you? 
Yeah, I mean, I don't put a whole lot of stock in the the outcomes of the by elections because I feel like, you know, more often than not, sitting governments to lose by elections anyway. So, but but like you say, I guess in terms of um, the candidates, um, we've seen that the penny has finally dropped that national need to to diversify. I think mm. the, the litmus test will be whether or not um, Tama gets um, put into you know influential. Um, portfolios but mm. the, I think the thing with Christopher Luxon is you know for the first time in a long time National has a plausible leader and you know his strength is that he has been able to bring all his managerial skills to bear and steadied the ship and the revolving door of leadership has finally stopped and they look far more credible the, but the, the challenge for him is he still doesn't quite understand the political game is still making like easily avoidable gaffes. Um, fortunately, he's got Nicola Willis to come in and clean up after him, but he's going to really need to get on top of that next year, I think. But, you know, it's it's like you say, it's theirs to lose. More attention is going to be paid by the public at large to those things, some of them small, some of them, when we talk about narrative, when National were in disarray, a lot of the things that Luxon has endured this year, like take, for example businesses going soft, which is sort of a slip of the tongue that he mm. made at a policy exchange think tank Q&A in London. Yeah. But something like that w- would have been felt like, talk about momentum, trademark God of Sharma, the, that could could be seen to be part of a snowball, right? Whereas he sort of, in this year, each one of those. But in election year, the spotlight's going to be on those things, Ben. Yep. How, 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 how do you, what does your crystal ball tell you about Christopher Luxon election year? Well, you know, I, I've long said for as long as Luxon has been in politics, which I think is about, about three years since he announced that he was going to stand in botany, mm. uh, he he gets better. You know? <laughs> He's like, getting better, like, yeah, yeah. Like, mm. like a reassuring youth pastor, I put my, my hand on the shoulder of the electorate and say, it gets better. <laughs> he, um, he, he does improve. He is a quick study. Uh, he, he doesn't tend to make the same mistake twice. Um, we've t- we talked quite at length what about... What do you mean by that? Uh, well, in, he, he tends to course correct. So in terms of the abortion stuff, which has sort of tripped him up, you know... Actually, maybe, yeah, maybe right. Maybe he doesn't. He does make the same mistake, but he doesn't make it in the same way. So with abortion, <laughs> with, with with abortion, first of all, he said, "Oh, it's just not, it's just not relevant," you know. And then he sort of had to kind of double down, you know, as people, um, you know, as, as the sort of uh, online informed media. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because it's there's 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 the demand. There's the fam- familiar, familiar familiarity with policy detail. I think is one thing. You know, he needs yeah. to be. The other stuff is kind of trade craft. It's like political trade craft, knowing how to uh, how to redefine a question in such yeah. a manner that you mm. can answer it more professionally, how to and, avoid and I think the question he's or how to at that dissemble. Stuff. I, yeah, 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 he's, yeah, he's, 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 he's getting much better at the art of the interview. The one, that, you know, in terms of, you know, pivoting, bridging, I'm going to answer the question that I would have liked to have been asked rather than the question that I was asked. And he's getting better at just saying, I'm not going to answer that because yeah. we'll, uh, we'll have that, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, the the one problem that does seem to keep cropping up is that he, he seems to find it very hard to talk about ordinary people in a way that yeah. comes across as non weird. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something about there's something about the way he describes things, and all politicians do this, and most of them sound kind of clunky, right? D- David Shearer was kind of like this. He would say. You know, I was talking to a guy who was on his roof, the painter on the roof, <laughs> yeah, he was painting his roof, yeah. and he said things are getting hard yeah, yeah. under this national government. And you know, it didn't ring true. And and Luxon Luxon doesn't purport to be telling anecdotes, but he has these sort of visual images. And the most recent mm. one was the two brothers in the garage mm. in South mm. Auckland, yeah. and they're sort of just specific enough that you're like, that's he's not yeah. just generalising, but they're also sort of they don't sort of ring true enough to kind of experience to seem like details from his life and so there's a kind of uncanny valley I think that he sort of falls mm. into so I think they should just sort of sit him down with the the GPT-3 chatbot for a while <laughs> over summer and just just GPT-3 just, just talk, just talk yeah. it out <laughs> just, just talk it out just, just, Jesus just Christ, have, you're probably right um, give me a good answer to the question do you 
believe abortion is okay. Yeah, or just just you know go go with Tama Potaka, go to the Marae, meet the people. Mm. Not 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 some big ceremonial thing. Just hang out. Just going hang to be out. On, the, on that point, out. going to be interesting. Just by the way, doing to figure out this, going to be interesting to see how Lux and. Uh, uh, engages with Waitangi uh, in, uh, in the start of next year and just how mm. present he is and uh, all of that. I, apparently Did he go last some year? decisions still being made. This year? Um, the, the, the porphyry is really early this year. It's, it's like there's a... The, the, the political porphyry is on like the, the, the third or the second. Oh, wow. Like, and then there's the weekend and then Waitangi. Anyway, um, the... The other, the other thing is the small target strategy, which we talked about a bit on this podcast, yeah. and we'll see in election year just the truth of that. Luxon was interesting in one interview in which he said that, I think it might have been with RNZ, in which he was asked about key in English and incrementalism, and he said that it, the time demanded bolder action, which I thought was an interesting thing. Mm. I wonder if that's really the case, or whether it is more, you can talk in terms like that, but actually provide as little as possible. Mm. I mean, a lot of it depends, right? Because Key didn't, Key and English didn't repeal much that the Clark government had put in place. They talked about working for families was communism by stealth. Kiwi Saver was, I think, overt communism. Um, this government is promising to repeal a lot more that this, this, this government this, has done. This, this would be government, yeah. So you wouldn't. So that wouldn't be incrementalist, yeah. right? You would. You, you if, if you're getting rid of three waters, that's not incremental. You're not you know, marginally ticking oh, okay. back. So whereas key, 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 decre, key, decre, decre, de, 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 yeah, key, key and English took the the Employment Relations Act and then they moved it back a couple okay. of degrees. Whereas these guys, they're going to take a hammer to the three waters and then they're going to hand the community assets back <laughs> and small town be fine. Zealand, throwing out shower yeah. heads and yeah. except they won't, they won't, will they? They'll, they'll, they'll do a repeal that is not a full re- and will involve shifting some of the entities well, around. We don't know. And, we don't and know. are they they're repealing Te Whatu Water or not? Where did they get no, on that? No, they're going to keep that now. That. But they're mm. repealing the the Maori health, Maori health yeah, yeah, just, sorry, yeah, which may, I mean that doesn't seem to have had a lot of we'll see. so mm. far. Um, hey, let's move on to uh, ACT, the Association of Consumers and Taxpayers, covering the whole gamut. There, the you've got to take your proverbial hat off, Annabelle, because two predictions. One was that after years of a solo caucus with David Seymour having a group of new MPs. The stories tell us when that happens, there's a whole lot of kind of internal upheaval or some scandal with some minor MP no one's ever heard of or whatever. That hasn't happened. There's been discipline. There have even been a few that have emerged from within the caucus as people who wouldn't look completely unhinged as potential cabinet ministers. But also, when National stop being totally useless acts polling didn't go through the floor Mm. which was the other thing Mm. that some might have expected to happen that the idea was the act are doing fine but that's only because national are an absolute mayhem Mm. when national get their shit together then then they'll fall away again they've held they've held their ground uh what's your i think i think it would be churlish to say that david seymour is not the highest performing party leader in parliament. You know, he understands his support base and he um, advocates on their behalf, like, unflinchingly. And, yeah, it's incredible that um, ACT has been able to maintain that that momentum um, despite, you know, Luxon coming in and, and, um, and steadying the ship for... For national, so yeah, and I think you know, as a result, we're not going to see the likes of Winston return to Parliament. Mm. Ben, you've previously, you're not now, but in some elections past, you were an advisor to the ACT Party. I think you were a critical part of them achieving about one point three, one point four percent. Something like that was twenty seventeen. I think they got about um, zero point. Zero point oh, six, big six or was it zero point oh six? Right. Yeah. So you can a lot. if you were advising <laughs> ACT going into election year, what would it be? I mean, do they just kind of hold the line? They they've, they've got a very efficient machine. The press releases probably during yep. the course of recording this podcast, we've had seven or eight 
uh, inventively headlined press they, releases they, land in the inbox. They're extremely good staff. Um, their chief of staff and their good chief press staff, secretary good, good are just absolutely top notch. Uh, they're very good researchers, and they're uh, going to come under more scrutiny, though, aren't they? In some ways, because as the I've talked about this before, they call it a proxy war, or this kind of uh, the Labour Party will. Labour Party have lost the 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 Liz Luxon line because National have ditched that yep. top tax rate policy. But then the tension moves to look at these guys; they can't govern without them, and some of their policies stop being just kind of hypothetical or abstract so much as and real that, real world. And that will be interesting because. I- I think, you know, there were some news stories last year, I think maybe Thomas Coughlin wrote uh, last election, it, you know, ACT removed some of the some of their policies from their website, um, which were, you know, some of their more sort of classically Rogernomics, you know, sort of um, market liberal policies. Right. Emotional genius staff. Um, and, the, and, and, they, and I think they see, I can't even remember whether they said those policies are inoperative right now or we're not campaigning on those policies or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and, the, and the truth is that there are a bunch of traditional historic act policies that, you know, have never been popular and are probably still not popular mm. now. Um, and and the, the question will be whether they just sort of... It, it's harder to just say we don't have a policy in this area if you're likely to be, a, you know, the Deputy Prime Minister. Yeah. Um, you generally, you'll have to have a policy. Um, you can't just take it off the website. So the question is, do they moderate the policy? Do they... Um, come up with new policy because you know again you know they are now uh 32 you know almost almost three and a half decades removed from roger T- douglas's heyday in parliament and they don't need to cling tenaciously to that legacy they can re- you know reinvent their policy i don't think he'll be deputy prime minister though do you i don't think national would agree to have Rather than Seymour prime minister, as, as deputy, I don't think they want. I think, I think I think they'd think consider it a bigger risk to give them finance. I don't. So that well, would no, be well, the, no, the sort. No, they wouldn't give them finance. So, they, yeah, whether you give them sort of nominal deputy or if if he just wants sort of. Yeah, so it, it depends what he would like. Yeah, but if you can give Winston Peters deputy, or, why can't you give David Seymour deputy? I just don't think they would. I think they will. That word. You yeah. do? They, they get a lot. I mean, Seymour, there's much more trust there with Seymour than they, they, they have with, say, Winston Peters. Um, let's talk then about Winston Peters since we're on it. Um, you, Annabelle and Ben, have both consistently said you don't think it's going to come through. You look at the polling, the most recent polling has the average of polling on New Zealand First across the, the published polls is 3.6. Not bad a year out by 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 any measure. He is he Winston Peters, the leader of the New Zealand First Party, is busy turning his regular tirades against the evil mainstream media into something that uh, is speaking the language of the quote unquote freedom movement, and he's merely sponging up that whatever there is in that constituency to the dismay of Matt King and and various others who we won't uh, waste the time talking about, but. But there's a it's pretty close to five percent. It's pretty close to five percent. I don't want to do too much guesswork, but do you? He's ruled out working with Labour, Annabelle. I guess the question really is for look for Christopher Lux and Andrea Vance post this. It's a quite a big call. He could go. He could probably kill them if he just said we will not work with New Zealand First. Um. Hard for me to give a dispassionate view on this because of how much I would like him to do that. Um, I, you know, I I think it makes electoral sense for National to just slit New Zealand First's throat and just say there's no way through. You cannot be in government. You've ruled out Labour and you can't be in government with us. What's Seymour's position? Would he be in a coalition with ACT and New Zealand Pe- First? Peters would not be in a coalition with, with Seymour. He'd try and do the same thing that they did with the Greens, which was sort of, you know, push them out, emasculate them, you know, Sort of strip them of any power, but there is a scenario. I'm starting to think that it was a real mistake for for Winston to rule out working with Labour because I think for people who are like sort of left wing but grumpy, you know, who quite like yeah. the idea of of having a handbrake, um, that he's alienated them now. And I think why would you and people on the right why would you vote for? 
a guy outside of parliament, there's no guarantee that he'll get back in when you can just give your vote to to David Seymour or to National, who are there and where everything is very clear and out there. The other thing too that I think will make it hard for Winston is it's, it's hard trying to get elected back into parliament from outside, um, particularly when you don't have an, an, a natural home like the Māori Party did, you know, like when you've still got a Māori seat where you can contest and have a pretty good shot of getting he it. He doesn't have the, the, the tauranga from yeah, years Yeah, and then I think, you know, in terms of like when the, when the debates happen and stuff, like usually they don't include parties that are outside of Parliament, so he may not get the level of exposure that he th- he well, they'll expects three, they'll that he's going to get. And three point six will get them in. Will get them into those debates, I imagine. I mean, at least to the minor party debates. You know, if they go the same way they have in recent years and have the two have National versus Labor, and then the rest in another pool. Are the but are the thresholds set on percentages? Yeah, normally some of them do. Really, you can yeah. set your own process. You've just got to. You're just going to be repeated, defended in court yeah. against Peter Dunn and Jim Anderton. <laughs> and, Colin <Craig. laughs> and Colin Craig. And Colin Craig. That's right. Um, l- l- let's keep rocking through the Greens. We need to talk about the this. You know, they've been in this strange, unusual formation of being like a toe in the government and yeah. the rest of the body out of the government and trying to negotiate that. And James Shaw really running the climate change project. Which... James Shaw has been sort of like a, a strange figure who's kind of part of the government but not really and not really seen as necessary yeah. and same as, same with the Greens. And the big plot point, <laughs> the big plot point as far as the Greens are concerned were was about James Shaw being uh, thrown out of the co-leadership after more than 25% of the delegates who voted saying that they didn't want him and that it's sort of been a, a broiling discontent in part of the party, and the you know the language they use now is different theory of change, which is which is broad, broadly true. I mean, it's it's it's, it's yeah. truer than the idea that there's the the climate greens yeah, yeah. and the true. social issues greens. Mm. You know, that's it doesn't quite work like that. But there is a group of people, you know, sort of a sort of Sue Bradford. Uh, uh, type strain, which is about you need to the way, the way that you change things is not by get going into lots of meetings with these people, kind of thing. Anyway, he got thrown out, and then he, in a weird sense, a it didn't have the impact on the polls probably because people weren't that that interested or people weren't paying attention more generally. But also, he went out and did meet you know actually met members for a while, kind of after having spent a lot of time working on policy work mm. and so on and so forth, and and he says that he found that quite um, uh, uplifting and, uh, I guess, energising and informative, and then he came back and he won thoroughly. And in a weird sense, there was it could have been a blessing in disguise, I reckon, Annabelle, because apart, apart from anything else, it means that that's not going to happen in an election year, and the Greens have had their leadership issues in election years, and it would be seems unlikely now that the with any of the factions within the Greens would challenge Shaw in election year. And he's probably, I don't know how much longer he wants to stay in that role, but he'll certainly have a run at an, an election year with Marama Davidson beside him. Mm. Yeah, I think it was, you know, turned out to be just a storm in a teacup, really, didn't it? And like you say, most people didn't pay attention anyway. It's strange with the Greens because they're... Support is holding up despite not achieving very much at all. And I think, you know, if you were to, to rank, like, green perform, green the Greens' performance, like, probably the highest performing Green is actually Tori Whanau, and she's not even... <laughs> yeah. and Chloe, she, Chloe and she's not even in Parliament. to have policy impact. You know? followed, followed by Chloe, yeah. absolutely. But, but, you know, I do question why Chloe's not being given more of a platform or some sort of more higher up role within the within the party because I think she, you know, it's good for Auckland Central to see their guy winning. I, I think you, that I think it's really hit on something, right, which is that the Greens do actually tend to be most popular apparently over a long period of time. They're, they're most popular when they're just supporting Labour and talking about Green stuff. 
It's not when they rebel or when they strike out on their own or they get big policy wins. It's just when they're being the good green support to Labour. And, you know, if you're cynical, you could say that's because the, the sort of largely middle class, richer, wider sort of electorate that votes for the Greens are doing sort of as a salve for their consciences, right? And but then sort of the counterpoint of that is, you know, when you have the wild activist Greens, you know, with a different theory of change, who are railing and they 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 want something more. They want they want like real power and agitation. And then when they get it, it's sort of dumb. James Shaw, there's like, well, we, do, we don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> we don't. And, and you start to think, like, maybe neither of the strains of the Greens, the, the sort of acceptable or unacceptable faces, really have much of an idea of what they want to do beyond sort of... Yeah, platitudes in a oh, lot of cases. Well, I mean, you know, they, you know, I, so, I don't so, think that's true of individual MPs, yeah. mm-hmm. but in terms of what is it that the supporters and the activists are looking for, I think in a lot of cases yeah. they don't really know. And that's probably mm-hmm. true insofar as a lot of their support, the reason it's held up so well in part is because people who feel as though Labour haven't been transformative and mm-hmm. left enough fall in there or green enough, and then also a growing kind of uh, general, you know, the, the as people tip over the voting age, which I think is still 18, Ben, you, despite your efforts to make it 16, increasingly more people will vote on the basis of climate change. It's still a relatively small number of people who have that as their most important issue, but it's it's not it's it, it's not nothing, is it? The interesting thing as well is if they were to. <laughs> If they were to make it across the line somehow, Labour and Greens, it's still amazing that the Greens have never been part of a fully fledged part of a of a of a cabinet. You know, they've had they've mm. had they've had ministerial roles, but they've never done the full the full the full bore coalition agreement. And in light of those things you say, it'd be interesting to see how how they how they manage that were that to come to pass. Let's talk about Te Party Māori and about pretty reasonably strong strong year for for their two MPs. Mm. I, I, in election year, one of the interesting things will be in Te Tai Aru. Yeah. Um, Adrian Rudolph here, shout out to him for adding a nice sense of calm, a sort of balming ointment for the parliament in the late part of the year. But does he move list and does that create the potential for some sort of arrangement with Labour? Debbie Ngāde Wapaka stood in that seat. I'm not sure if he will go on the list. Um, maybe he will and they'll select another candidate. I don't think Labour will want to be seen as backing down in Te Tai Hauaru. I don't think they'll cut a deal mm. with Deb. I think that Te Pāti Māori has performed exceptionally well over the last three years, um, you know, restoring the faith of Māori voters who'd become completely disenchanted with the last... Māori Party mm. who looked like just sort of enablers for the key government that was very unpopular with, with Māori voters and now they look like a, you know, an, an independent party that doesn't kowtow to either side. I think the challenge that they have is articulating their positions on different pieces of policy, like it's one thing to make it clear what you don't support or who you don't support, but to be able to then articulate what your policy is or how you think something should be addressed or fixed or remedied or whatever your idea is, is um, is important too. And I, I feel like that's probably an area where they need to do a little bit of work in. Mm. What do you think, Ben? Do you think that there are a chance in other of the Māori sets? I mean... You know, Hone Hardawera could yet come to the hey, party. I was bemused to see. Um, did you see who stood against Tamapotaka in uh, for Hamilton West? Donna Pokere Phillips, who um, stood for the Maori Party in the Waikato. Did she uh, not, for ha- Hauraki. But what party was she standing for in Hamilton West? For that? She's she's now at the um, co-leader of the Outdoors yeah, the Party outdoor with, with Sue, Sue Gray. Gray. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was like, Whoa. That's a Facebook lives, that's a, a journey. Yeah. <laughs> the Māori Party had a really great candidate in Te Waipounamu last time who was who was really um, yeah, but impressive, but Dino will not be unseated no. in Te Waipounamu. <laughs> the, 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 
you know, he's the, the, the very popular MP down there. That's right. right. That's uh, right. Yeah. Well, there, there's that, but also to be fair, like he is at every who. People think that, you know, he doesn't have a high profile as an MP. That's not how he's seen in the South Island. In the South Island, he is, you know, kind of similar to Parikura, like, you know, Kanohi Kitea, one of those guys that's seen you know, attending all the right hui and being very active in the electorate. I mean, let's not forget, it's an entire island that he's having to represent. So yeah, and a, and ha, a bit of Wellington. Ha, and a bit of Wellington, up to Porirua. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I, that won't be one of the seats that, that I think the no. Māori Party will be able to take off um, Hard Labour. Hard to see them. Uh, Ikanoa Rafati is, a, is somewhere where they've sort of you know, the, the past incarnations of the Māori Party and candidates have come close, but not really ever legitimately threatened. Um, Auckland, you know, Penny Henata he doesn't doesn't seem to have made much of a secret that he wants to go on the list um, over the last three to five years. Um, what was that? There was some statement though that came out about that. There was, there yeah, was which said that he's, he's very committed he's, to standing, he's on, the standing on, the, now, on the list. On the list, oh, no, no, on the list. Oh, sorry, oh, in the yeah. seat. In, yeah. in the seat. Yeah. So I mean, you know, very, very clear that he wants out, and just as clear that he is being corralled back in mm-hmm. by you know uh, whoever the chief whip is now with a big butterfly net on a stick. <laughs> Um, I, I don't see any easy any easy wins for them, but they could get their vote percentage up. Mm. You know, they're you're, they're, they're in that territory where you know they're doing TikToks. They're very good at social media. Yeah. they're oppositional in a way the Greens haven't really been as a mm-hmm. sort of support party. You know, you could see them. And they've up. got a stable leadership going into election year where they yeah. can, if they deploy those, plus. John Tamahiri, John, as president. John, John Tamahiri, who, you know, they may find a bit of their funding dries up if the SFO is still looking at the accounts. <laughs> okay, quickly. I think um, Te Tai Hauaru is the most likely one yeah. to flip. I yeah. think we can safely rule out um, Te Wai Paunamu, Hauraki Waikato, or um, Ikaro Rafati for from ever being um, flipped. From ever being and we, yeah, it, yeah. they will never, ever flip it because. Because, like, if you can confiscate the whole foreshore and seabed in those places and still get your MP back, and then you're then then you're good to go. I think probably the weak, the don't want to say weakest, but potentially to title Kido. Yeah, could it's be, funny how do we do it? I mean, he was he, he didn't rule it out that he could he could have a run. I don't think Hone would be able to flip that. He's done. They'd have okay. to get an exceptional candidate. That's probably the softest seat, I would imagine, at uh, the moment. Uh, a quick word on the Opportunities Party, which... Oh, uh, do we have The to? word is no. Yeah. Well, no. No, no, no. We're, it, we're ruling no. out a coalition with them. Ralph Munji has, a, has, a, right has an outside chance in, in Ireland. No, he doesn't. And, why, did, uh, why does he Toby, think we know this is exciting for you to believe these conspiracy theories because it makes as, your as, life as, more as, interesting, as, but he does not. As, as, as I understand, I Ruff Manji is telling everybody he bumps into in central Wellington that he's feeling really confident about his ground game in, in, in Ireland. So, <laughs> okay, I think you guys, are, I think you guys are going to be a bit harsh. I think, I think they're, I don't think they're completely out of it, and I think if they could, you know, get a little bit of attention, Toby, this, look at me. What? Look at me. Okay. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't want, Toby, I don't, t- yeah. look at me. Yeah. It's not happening. I don't want to sound. I don't want to sound Sorry. like sort of. I don't want to sound like uh, like Tumblr or something. But like this is very middle aged white man behaviour to be like. <laughs> oh, don't, no, maybe top of. I mean, they don't. We can't count them entirely. I mean, they're they've got some graphs. You, have you heard of UBI? <laughs> <laughs> this is this is this is like your red peak moment again. Oh, this Jesus is like, you just gotta Coming you gotta recognise when these things are happening. Uh, twenty twenty three. What kind of election? Very quickly, we're going to wind this up because everybody has had enough of this year. Twenty eleven teapot tapes. Twenty fourteen dirty politics and moment of truth. Twenty seventeen Jacinda mania, uh, and the. Green Metidia um, departing. 2020 COVID-19, the novel coronavirus. Uh-huh. 2023, we all, what I, I mean, I think we all know that we want, um, in light of the Australian election, we want at least one politician to tackle a child. <laughs> we want to see that happening. <laughs> what else? What, what kind of, what, what's, what's going to shape the election, define the election? What would be the epithet for the election, Ben Thomas? Uh, one word for you. Karaoke. 
Cuddy, okay. Can I just say, like, I've been thinking a lot about this, like, what policy could capture the imagination of mm. voters. Mm -hmm. And I really think, like, if one of the parties would adopt a policy of, like, like just promising to return the snacks, snifters, mm -hmm. biggins, like, all of those classic snack items, like, guaranteeing the electorate, that they will ensure that sanitarium are like forced to keep producing those things. Like that, that is a winning policy. I'm telling you, you are guaranteed to win. I agree. Um, I also think I saw they're going to be less. Uh, you know, they've been talking about the possibility of a fewer. For your public events, for your walk arounds, for your spontaneous during the campaign, kind of, yeah, spontaneous sort of yeah. chats, which suggests to me that there might be you know, a bit more, a few more Facebook lives, a few more direct, you know, a few more uh, 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 TikToks, and so I think I think we're going to see ever more elaborately staged, cute background activity. The babies of New Zealand will be relieved to hear that, eh? Yeah. With a, <laughs> like, like, ne like, Neve is going to be dropped no in by, like, us. a zip line. <laughs> Christopher Luxon's pets will be sort of riding unicycles, like, on the Simpsons. Top political like. analyst Ben Thomas is predicting this will be the social media election. <laughs> You're here to hear, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us in 2022. We're back in 2023, even better. We'll probably even do more more podcasts. Might do more. Do you might do better, might do bigger. Thank you to members. If you want us to do more, bigger, better, then join spin-off members because that's the only way we can keep this old horse and cart going. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Annabelle. Have a great break if you are lucky enough to be having one. Kia ora. Kia ora. This is Climate Adaptation. We are the Portiki of the tile, and the words of those keeping the home fires burning. It's more than just going along and planting some trees. You've got to be able to defend that place to the end of your life. We have the solutions. We just need to come back to the belief in ourselves as rangatira. Join me, Nadine Huda, and Ruia Apirehama, the Kopapa Korangi Series 2, Ahika. Brought to you by Te Komato Te Tonga, the Deep South Challenge. Out now on the Spin Off Podcast Network or wherever you get your podcasts. Kia ora e te iwi, te Ahe Butler here, Podcast Manager at the Spin Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin Off Podcast Network.